Winnipeg. Welcome to our annual Small Business Marketing Forum. Uh, my name is Carly Minish and I am the founder of SmackDab and co-chair of the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce's Small Business Advisory Council. I'm thrilled to be here this morning as your host. So before we start, on behalf of the Chamber, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional land of the Ojibwe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene Nations, and the homeland of the Red River Métis. In a regular year, December in Winnipeg would mean spending our evenings and weekends with family and friends, shopping at countless local markets like the Third and Bird and the Scattered Seeds Market. And for the past four years, the Chamber has hosted our own lo uh, shop local market at the uh, December Small Business Marketing Forums. As the owner of SmackDab, I've participated as a vendor in these Chamber markets. And there's always the wonderful traditions like the smell of apple cider, the sound of festival, uh, festive music, and the buzz of our community shopping local. And let's not forget when Lauren, the chamber president and CEO, dressed up as Santa one year, and he advises that thanks to his quarantine diet, he now fits the Santa suit perfectly. Uh, please note, Lauren adds to the script that as a way of sharing and reminding all of us that we should cut ourselves a little bit of slack, if we've been enjoying a few more treats over the past few months, that is totally normal and we are coping the very best we can. So if that means eating an extra cookie or two, just enjoy. I know personally, I've been eating a lot of ice cream. We're gonna hear more about ice cream in a little bit. Although this holiday season, we can't physically be together like we usually are, we can still meet as a community and still support our small local businesses. So today's virtual programming is set up to reflect your usual in-person forum experience. So for example, as you logged in today, you hopefully saw the networking tab on the left-hand side. And there you can enter one on one vid uh, video sessions with other attendees. And when you're ready to shop and explore local makers and products, you can click the expo to enter the virtual shop local market and chat with the makers live today. Or maybe you have a client or friend you want to say hello to now is your chance. Simply click on the people list on the right hand side and send them a private message. These are just a few of the features we have available for you to grow and uh, connect with your network all from home or office. If you have any technical issues today, please contact our chamber staff or volunteers through the chat on the right hand side. They are listed as WCC help under the people list. So before we jump into our program today, I just want to thank our small business sponsors, of course, BDC, KPMG, Chamber of Commerce's group insurance plan, and of course, our VC. So thank you to each one of you for supporting our small business community, especially during these incredibly difficult times. So today's small business marketing forum is all about equipping you or small business community and members with leading marketing tips and trends from your local marketing experts. Especially with the pandemic, it, it really is emphasized the need for small businesses to master their online presence and communicate effectively with their desired um, audience virtually and on the social media platforms. So today we have four uh, mini 10 minute keynotes and each keynote will focus on one specific marketing trend or takeaway and one specific tip that you and as a business owner can take back to your drawing board and reevaluate how reevaluate how you do your marketing. So our topics today will touch on best practices for sales, content writing, social media and even corporate social responsibility. So grab a notebook and get ready to take some notes. Or if you prefer to just rewatch this video, it will be posted on the website for easy on demand viewing. Okay, so let's get started with our first talk here. So our first keynote is titled The Art and Science of Selling by Sina Fan. Sina, um, Sina is the Senior Manager of Business Enablement at RBC. Sina is a sales professional with a career spanning 24 years in the areas of marketing, international development, media, education, and finance. What a resume. In her current role, Sina has the responsibility for leading the change management, implementation, and communication of business strategies and initiatives from coast to coast. Sina is also a certified coach with extensive experience in coaching, developing, and training. Sina was born and raised in China at the age of 14. She moved to Hiroshima, Japan with her parents before making Canada her home in 1998. She is passionate about all dimensions of diversity and inclusion and has an affinity for supporting the newcomer experience. Sina, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your knowledge with us. I'm going to hand it over to you now. 
Thank you, Carly. I'm Sina Fan, and I'm also known as Sina from China. I'm really proud of my heritage, as you can tell. But also, I'm hoping to, you know, this would be easier for you to remember my name. So I'm really honored to be here today to talk about something I'm truly passionate about, the art and science of selling. It's based on one of my favorite books by Daniel Pink, To Sell as Human. Many of us here are uh, business owners and we've all hired our um, sales team in the past. So I have a question for you. When you're hiring a salesperson, who do you think that makes the best salesperson? Is that an introvert or an extrovert? Let's take a look. Adam Grant from University of Pennsylvania did a study in the past. He learned that it's neither introverts or the extroverts makes the best salespeople. It's the people right in the middle, and they are called the ambiverts. They probably have the ability, the best ability, to connect with people at the same time, also listen to other people's needs. So when you hire the next salespeople, keep this in mind. And the good news is very few of us are on the either extreme. Majority of us are somewhere in the middle. Today, one in nine people identify as in sales. So what happened to the other eight, you might ask? I ask you the same question. What about doctors, professors? Are they in sales? Well, let's think about the definition of sales. If I convince you or try to convince you to give up your time and your ideas and things you're doing and to do something that I want you to or try my ideas, that is selling, isn't it? So let me ask again, are doctors in sales? What about professors? I think you know the answer. We're all in sales all the time. So when we're talking about ABC in sales in the past, it's always the clothing. Many of us are very, very familiar with those terms. However, Daniel Ping has a different set of um, uh, definition for ABC. A as attunement, B as buoyancy, and C, clarity. Let's take a closer look. What does he mean by that? So when we're talking about attunement, it's a perspective taking ability. It's not empathy, let's not get it wrong, but it's a cognitive skill. So do you understand what they're thinking and what their needs might be? Now let's take a look about power. What's the relationship between power and perspective taking? Power leads people to anchor too heavily to their advantage points and become insufficiently to adjust to others' perspectives. I think we've all encountered one or two uh, very arrogant salespeople. The moment you walk in, they already come across as they're so much better than you. They know so much. When that happens, what happened to you? You immediately get turned off and don't want to deal with him anymore or her. So one thing Daniel Pink said in his book, and I love, I, I absolutely love, he said, you can increase your power by reducing it. I'm gonna repeat that again. You can increase your power by reducing it. This is not powerful. Let's look at strategic mimicry. So think about in the past when you were having a really engaged conversation with someone, or in the future if you are in such a situation. Pause for a second. You will notice your body language is very much in sync with each other. It's human nature that when we get excited, when we're really enjoying our conversation, we automatically start to become more in sync with one another. So we can strategically speed this process up a little bit by mimic the other person. 
However, at the same time, please don't overdo it and don't just focus on that because it will backfire on you. Buoyancy. I actually looked up what's the meaning of buoyancy. It says here, act upward uh, for the kind of situation encountered in everyday experience. So in Daniel Pink's book, he mentioned the last salesperson for Fuller Brush. I think many of us know Fuller Brush. His name is uh, Norman Hall. Norman Hall describes sales as an ocean of rejection. All of us, I think, have experienced this once or twice in our lives. So when we're going after our next uh, prospect, next client, we get a little bit sweaty in our hands, our heart rate goes a little bit higher, and we're getting really, really nervous because we all know we're afraid of being rejected. But I want you to ask yourself, who is the biggest critic of yourself? Not those clients, not the prospects. It's you. You are the biggest critic of yourself. So every morning when you wake up, you look into the mirror. A lot of people, before they even get out of their doors, they look at themselves and going, mm, I don't think I can do this. So I'm going to challenge you every morning when you wake up, when you see yourself first thing in the morning in that mirror, to tell yourself, I'm awesome. I can do this. So one thing we talk about interactive self talk before your next pitch or your next presentation, right before you go in, before you start, ask yourself, am I ready for this? Instead of just saying yes, think about all the things you've prepared for. It will prepare you for your next presentation or your pitch. Maintain a level of positivity. I love this. There is an online self-assessment. It's, uh, you can do it quickly. It, you can just search in Google positivity racial test. And the ideal ratio will be between one to three. I've done it, I'm not that high. So anytime when I'm feeling down, when I'm getting a little nervous, I know my positivity ratio is a little bit low, so I need to adjust that. And when people reject you, don't take that personal or persuasive or permanent thing. I suck. I can't do this. It's me. I should never have even tried this. Instead of that, let's change our mindset and think, I did not prepare for that one little thing this time. That's why it didn't work. It's very specific and it's temporary. I've learned my lesson, so I'm going to move on. Next time, I will be better. So let's think about clarity. Are we always clear of what we do? Are we always clear when we're explaining things and our clients are clear? I'm going to challenge on you on that because one of my professors when I was in university, she shared with us when she was in high school, in the middle of her class, a teacher stormed into the classroom, started yelling match, slammed the door and left. Her teacher said, don't talk to anybody and write down what you just saw. 24 students, 24 completely different stories. So next time when you think you're very clear when you're explaining things, think about that story. And our clients, our prospects, do they really know what they want? Is it the problem is always what it seems to be? I don't think so. So instead of being the problem solver, what about become a problem finder? Let's take Apple as an example. If Steve Jobs, all he did was to try to figure out how to make a better phone where you can answer, uh, dial someone, and send text messages, iPhone will never have existed. He found something we never, we didn't even know we needed, is that microcomputer does everything beyond just phone calls, everything you can think of, that phone solves it. That's why he stood out. So next time, when you are out there, I want you to think about the new ABC and be curious. Wow, thank you, Saina, for spending your morning here with us. Some great insights indeed. So to introduce our next keynote, I want to welcome our sponsor, Scott Sissons, a partner at KPMG, to say a few words. Good morning. I'm Scott Sissons, a partner at KPMG, and your past, past chair of the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce. I'm really thrilled that you're taking time out of your busy schedule to get together 
share and learn this morning. Small business is the soul of our economy in Winnipeg. So thank you for everything that you're doing to keep the entrepreneurial spirit alive. At KPMG, we've been very busy supporting our small business clients on navigating through the pandemic. From assisting with the myriad of government programs to return to workplace and contingency plans and to just increasing resiliency. While today's programming is about online marketing and reimagining your connections, one thing the inner accountant in me wants to remind everyone is it's very important to have timely, accurate, and relevant information to make nimble decisions in your businesses. We have just introduced an innovative cloud based solution called KPMG Finance Plus to help your small business stay organized and on track. It's never been so important to know where you stand on important metrics like working capital, managing cash flows, and other data points needed for the various government COVID programs. It's an all-in-one solution that also provides insights you can trust. So please reach out to me if anyone's interested in learning more. So moving on to our programming, our next mini marketing keynote will share tips on writing content people will actually read. Brian Borzikowski is an award-winning business journalist who has written for the New York Times, CNBC, Washington Post, The Globe and Mail, and many other publications. He's the founder and editorial director of All Caps Content, a Winnipeg and Toronto-based agency that works with companies to create editorial quality branded content and communications such as magazines, podcasts, videos, articles, op-eds, and more. Brian also appears weekly on CTV News Channel and Sirius XM and has co-authored three personal finance books. He's the past president of the Society for Advancing Business Editing and Writing, an international organization for business journalists. Brian, welcome. Uh, thanks, Scott. Uh, I've done a lot of work with KPMG in the past before, so uh, you know where to find me if uh, you need any help with your contents. Um, I'm Brian Borzikowski, uh, as Scott mentioned, the founder of All Caps Content. We create content for all sorts of companies, content and communication plans and strategies, and um, I'm a longtime business journalist. And so uh, I've always felt that journalists know how to create content best, which is why I started my own agency, All Caps, a couple of years ago, because a lot of these places are started by marketing people and there's a lot of account managers. And um, the content creators often come into the process at the very end when they need to be there from the beginning. So that's why I started this, so we can have content creators and marketers there from the start, so your content can be created um, in the best way possible right from the beginning. Um, so I could talk about this topic for days, but I only have 10 minutes. Uh, for some reason, they only gave me 10 minutes. But um, so I'm going to talk about how to write the right content. I also uh, you can call you maybe call it how to think like a journalist. I have five uh, steps I'm going to go through, and then we can talk a little bit more about sort of the mechanics of creating content. But the first step to creating good content is what is the story you want to tell, and why do you want to tell it? When I was an editor at uh, magazines and at newspapers, um, I would always tell the journalist pitching me that what is the why? Why is this important? Why should people care? You need to think about that too. It's hard sometimes for marketers because you think everything is important about your business, but not all of it is. Um, so what do you want? What do your clients really need to know? And why is it relevant today? People want to read things that matter to them or see things. I mean, it's not just articles, podcasts, videos. I mean, there's all sorts of ways to create content now. Um, so ask yourself the why is this important? Why is it relevant today? Number two is be authentic. This is something that a lot of people have trouble with because they're used to creating pitches, marketing pitches, product placements. Um, content needs to be authentic just in the same way that you would read something in the Globe and Mail or the New York Times. Um, it has to be that kind of storytelling. If it's full of product placements or marketing speak, people will immediately tune out. I mean, yes, it seems obvious, but again, it's hard. I mean, you want to get things in there um, when really you should be taking them out. Uh, why would you then create content if your products aren't in there? Because you're giving people information that they find important. Help them. Give them advice. Make them think. Um, they're coming to you for a reason, so give them something to think about but they know that they're coming to you. So even if you're not saying, we have this amazing product, they're on your site or they're finding you elsewhere, they know that you're delivering the content and they will make that connection between your brand and that information. You want them to feel good about it. You, about it. you want them to say, you know, this is really interesting. I'm gonna look and find out more about this company. The other point, number three, is to think holistically. 
So one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make all the time is that they do one-off pieces of content. They just create an article uh, that they might want to, you know, then put in the Winnipeg Free Press or the Globe and Mail or on their website, and they think they've done content. They're happy. They, you know, dust off their hands and walk away and say, I'm a content creator. That's not how it works. Um, content is about more than just articles as well. It's about a consistent, um, long-term approach to talking to your customers and to your clients and potential clients. And so you have to think about it in multiple ways. Now, people want to be, uh, people consume media in, in many different uh, situations and in many different ways today. So think articles, podcasts, videos, white papers, events. I mean, all of this is content. How do your clients or people you want to reach consume media? You need to think about that. And then you need to figure out a strategy, a content strategy about how you're going to reach them. Again, it has to be beyond one story. Um, think about ways that you can double up on content. So if you have a video, can you then turn that audio of the video into a podcast? Can you take that video and turn it into um, an article? Maybe the, the expert says something and then you can create something that says, you know, 10 ways to, to do X. Um, maybe you can turn a white paper into four different articles. Double up on that because what I find that people is that people create something, they leave it for a month, they call somebody else and they say, hey, I need a video. We have this article we did four weeks ago. Now we have a video we want to do. Um, and then they're paying twice. So why do that? Try and work with somebody who can do it all so that you can then double up on this. It saves you money. It increases your content outputs. And um, you can hit people in all sorts of different ways. So again, long term that is an investment. It's slow, but it takes time to build up that expertise, that thought leadership, the stories, and people will come once that uh, volume is there. Number four, think about distribution. Now, this is really, really important that everybody forgets about. Everyone. Um, creating content for the sake of creating content is not fun. It's not fun for you. It's expensive. It's not fun for the content creators. Um, they want people to read the stuff or see the stuff that they create. So if you create something and you don't have a distribution plan, what is the point? What's a distribution plan? Um, think about newsletters, think about um, social media ads, maybe there's traditional advertising, depending on how big this campaign is and where this content fits in. Um, so you, again, you need to get this out there. Um, one of the best things to do is clients. Clients are a built-in audience. They're expecting to get content from you they're already opening your emails. They already have a relationship. So start there. If you have, uh, you know, a thousand clients, create a newsletter and promote this content in that newsletter. Newsletter is its own kind of content, um, but you have to think about how you're going to get this out. So that's important and needs to be done from the start, not after the content's created, or you'll be. It's a lot harder to figure out what to do. And you might, you know, after all the the work of creating content, you might be exhausted and say, uh, "This will get out the way it is." But um, you need to think about this from the start. The last point, um, or the fifth point, and there's many more points, but um, number five is make sure it's high quality. There are many, many companies with huge budgets that create really bad content. And it's not just about the words, it's about the graphics, the interplay of the text and, and, and the visuals that people do not sort of connect. Um, that why is often missing. Why am I reading this? Your clients are media consumers. They're used to reading the New York Times, the Globe and Mail, the Winnipeg Free Press. They're used to listening to podcasts and videos. They're watching TV. They're watching Netflix. They understand high quality, even if they maybe can't articulate it. So they know when something bad comes, they'll turn it away. They won't uh, flip it open. They won't go onto the website. It does take some investment, but you need to make sure that um, it's actually going to be read. So my point there is that it has to be as high quality as the things that they're used to reading. Just because you're a company who's creating content, don't think that you can create some subpar um, article that is, you know, full of mistakes or not read well, or again, too marketing, too promotional. People will tune out quickly because they're savvy media consumers, savvier than ever before. So think carefully about that. Just a couple more points here. So those are sort of the top five things that I think that are very important to consider. Um, but content works. So why does content work? It builds brand loyalty. 
to get your message across without having to invest in a big marketing campaign, but it also can inform marketing initiatives. I've created a number of brand narratives and a brand narrative is basically your company story for a particular product, for your whole company. Um, and it's written in a story. I write them in the same ways that I write an article and you can take that and use that to inform marketing campaigns, other pieces of content, um, communications with clients. So content can inform other things as well. Uh, you know, I've worked with some companies where they've taken some of my articles, they sent those out as public relations pitches and um, the, they've gotten press from this. So they haven't just created a press release, they've actually sent journalists content that they could read and then pull things out of um, that they could, you know, then rewrite, not rewrite, but uh, have some idea as to what kind of questions to ask where the story is going. So you can use it for a whole, all sorts of things. Content can also influence behaviors. Um, you can get people to do certain things. And once we did some content for Rogers Wireless, working on a magazine for them, and uh, they wanted people to call into their call center less for very small things. So we made infographics on how to's, how to, you know, turn off your phone, those kind of basic things. They noticed that people stopped calling in less because they were getting content that actually informed them and changed some of those behaviors. When it comes to actually creating that content, there are just some key points here. Um, and, and it's the same for whether it's an article, whether it's a video, a podcast, or anything like that. Tell a good story. If the story is most important. So it's not just saying, you know, I'm interviewing your, your boss and saying, uh, let's talk about this. What is the reason there has to tell a story? It's got to be clear and concise. It has to get to the point quickly, which I'm hoping I'm doing here, but um, it, you know, it has to be short um, and informative. And again, I just sort of say back, what are you used to reading? What are you, media are you used to consuming? Think about that, how that gets across, and then apply it to your own content. But content does work, and uh, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. So thank you so much for having me. I wish we had more time, um, but I, I'm around for any questions uh, here or uh, in our breakout sessions, or you can send me an email at brian at allcapscontent.com, and I'm happy to, to respond and give some more advice. Thank you, Brian. Now for our next speaker. Until COVID hit, Daryl Stewart was a silent partner in Chaban Ice Cream, Winnipeg's award-winning small batch premium ice cream manufacturer. The ice cream I've also been eating a lot of during quarantine. With, with COVID, Daryl's knowledge of technology and marketing along with his bootstrapping savvy came in handy to help him save this brick and mortar company, pivoting the business to e-commerce and saving this local icon. Daryl is also co-founder and chief nerd of inclusionsystem.ca, a successful software company that makes life easier for agencies supporting people with disabilities, as well as ibexpayroll.ca, which many businesses uh, rely on. Uh, Daryl, I'll let you take it away. Well, thanks, Carly. So I'm going to talk uh, about kind of the, there's two different founding stories for Shea Van Ice Cream, and both of them have a, have a tie in uh, to social media strategy. First up, I should probably say I'm not a great tactician about social media. I'm more of the strategist, like why are we on social media? What is the goals and what are the things we're going to talk about? as opposed to how we do the photos and what exactly we say or, or how, to, how to be an expert on this platform. That, that is not me. What I'm gonna talk about is the strategy Shaban used in both of our, both of our founding times and uh, why we did what we did. So I'll first talk about when we opened Shaban. And that was almost three years ago. And um, the founding story of Shaban, you can check it out on our website if you like, but Joseph and I met through, uh, through um, a Syrian refugee initiative where we, he was involved. He was working really hard to bring over 17 family members of Zanab, and I won't get into that right now. Zanab is our third partner and Joseph's wife. Long story short, we decided uh, to open a premium ice cream shop in Winnipeg, the first homemade premium ice cream shop in Winnipeg. And we were really inspired by um, companies like Village Ice Cream in Calgary and Ernest Ice Cream in Vancouver and a number of uh, homemade ice cream shops in, in New York City. These were the, the things that inspired us. And we really thought Winnipeg was ready for that. And um, true to form, Joseph had his, his own way that he wanted to do that. You know, I had these business models in my, in my mind and um, he wanted to make the ice cream from, from literally from scratch, which is not what all these 
places I mentioned normally do. So we decided to have pasteurizing and homogenizing and blending, a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of extra equipment so that we could literally do it from scratch. And um, by the time we opened, we were a hundred thousand dollars over budget. And um, it took a lot of fortitude to follow through on our initial marketing and social media idea, which was we have to have a full-time person, someone that really understands uh, how to get our message out. We were doing something unique. We're doing something new in Winnipeg. It made actually more sense than ever, but it took more courage than ever to say, let's go ahead and start, hire someone full-time salary to get out our story. You know, it, it makes sense now when you look back and say, we spent all that money to put ourselves in that position. We really have to get the message out and uh, to do anything else would really be silly. And um, so we did that. We hired Christy, who uh, is still on the social media scene in Winnipeg. And um, she, she did a great job getting us on Instagram, on Facebook. Instagram was the real focus. And that, for our kind of business, that was the place to be. It's very visual. We have a beautiful storefront. We had uh, Instagram booths, photo booths, where you could take pictures of our, of our ice cream. And uh, it's a very, very photogenic, um, both our ice cream and our location, very photogenic, and uh, really lent itself to Instagram. And that was the place to be. And really, the mess. What were the the um, the kind of messages that worked for us? We were talking about our product, the flavors, the ingredients, about our founding story, and uh, about our core values. Talking about how we recycle our jars and, and stories like that. Those always seem to do well. And one thing that we realized. Um, mistake that we made at back then that we corrected was um, talking about our product name. You know, I think there's a, there's a temptation to get really caught up in, in who you are and talking about your culture and things like that. I've definitely fallen in that trap before because I, I really am passionate about the culture of companies that I'm involved with. We really needed to dial that back to about a third of our, uh, what we were talking about, two thirds about our ice cream. <laughs> You know, it's almost conceited when you think about it to talk too much about yourselves and not about your product. The product is what your customers are, are interested in. So that was something that we learned. Um, the second founding story of Shea Van and uh, how that connects to social media is what we did when COVID hit us, like Carly talked about in the intro, we were, we were 80% gonna be going bankrupt if we didn't do something very, very different. We lose money all winter. We need to make it in the summer. And there was going to be no summer this year. And it turned out to be worse than, than anyone predicted. We thought we'd be open by now for sure, but that's not the case. So uh, we went online and um, set up a Shopify store and set up a subscription service for our ice cream. And that saved our business. The, the generosity of Winnipeg getting on board with that really saved our business. Um, but the, the social media behind e-commerce is, is different. Um, it's not just about putting up posts about your latest flavor and what's new in your store. The store is closed. All there is is the latest flavor and, and promotions and, and connecting our product, which is now not just the ice cream, it's how we deliver it. And it's how you choose your flavors. It's the whole online product, which now requires two people, uh, more than two people, but generally two people to handle the kind of the marketing and social media related to the online Shaban store. And that's somebody thinking about how we're going to do the promotions and someone thinking about how we're going to market the promotions. You have to plan ahead what day they're going to be and do we have drivers ready to, to deliver the product? Do we have the labels ready for this stuff? Like something different about e-commerce is that suddenly um, you can have a lot of orders on your hands when you do it right, which is exactly what you want. So having kind of this two sides to the social media strategy, which is figuring out well in advance what our promos are going to be. Black Friday was really good for us, uh, but we really had to be ready on the logistics so that when we promoted it on social media, um, that we would be ready. So it now requires uh, two people. Some general stuff about social media. Um, you know, I talked about making sure you spend about two thirds of your time on your product, not yourself. And I think that's really important. And um, yeah, another is staying on top of your, your direct messages. Um, you know, we've been up and down on that right now. 
um, you really realize how important it is to be on top of people direct messaging you and replying. And um, that's really important part of social media. It's not just about pushing out your messaging. It's about um, being ready uh, and having people with time available to provide quality answers to people on when they're direct messaging, messaging you on Instagram, and Twitter, and Facebook. Um, the benefits of doing social media right for us have been massive. Um, just one thing that comes to mind is the credibility when we're talking with suppliers, when we're talking about partners, when we're talking to anybody and they look at our 15,000 followers on Instagram and that's, that's street cred. And um, it, it's come into play more than I ever realized. My other businesses are less about uh, you know, high volume social media. And so I hadn't experienced this before, but having those followers engaging with you is, uh, is something that, that people that we're looking at, including our bank even look at, which is funny, right? Um, so, um, yeah, I talked about making sure you're messaging about your product, not just yourself. Uh, I guess it goes in the opposite thing. Just constantly pushing your product is also, um, I think some, when we first started really focusing on product, maybe we went overboard. The, the, and the <clears throat> inserting a message about your culture, about the people inside your business from time to time, those, those actually get higher traction for us than any particular uh, product post, but it's finding that balance there that's really important. Um, yeah, so we've talked about the kind of the two strategic points in our business. One where we really a storefront and we're just trying to tell the story of what's going on inside the store and that Instagram was the, was the place for that. Um, another thing that's, and then the second was when we changed to, uh, to being an e-commerce company when it's had to get a lot more sophisticated with more skills involved uh, to get that done. I changed um, some experience shares for me on three years now of having a kind of a social media focused retail business. You know, the quality of our photography has definitely, and our writing has gone up and down over time, but it doesn't, when we first opened, it was probably at its highest level, and that was thanks to the person doing it. Um, but it, it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, it needs to be um, real, and it needs to be consistent. And we've had different people doing it over time, and it's more about the messaging and the sincerity of it than it is about that quality. It's a nice to have when you can do it at a really high level. Um, what you're saying and how your photography is and how it looks. But the most important thing is the actual strategy and, um, and the, that you're being <clears throat> uh, real in your messaging. And that's it for me. Thank you, Daryl, and congratulations to you, Joseph and Zainab, on the huge success Chaban has had in just its first few years. And with your incredible pivot uh, that you've made with your ice cream home delivery service, just amazing. So stay tuned for Joseph Chaban's reimagined story in the uh, coming weeks on the Winnipeg Chamber's website, uh, winnipeg-chamber.com. So, and finally, we have our last speaker for today's forum. Ibrahim Abi Khan was known for his nine-year career in the CFL, and he is more commonly known for his success as an entrepreneur owning two separate businesses here in Winnipeg, Shwarma Khan and the Green Carrot Juice Company. Following his CFL retirement in 2012, Abi opened his first Shwarma Khan and hasn't slowed down since. Shwarma Khan now has three locations in Winnipeg and three locations at the Investors Group Field. In 2014, Abi broke ground on Winnipeg's first cold pressed juice company. Three Greek green carrot juice company locations now feature the healthiest on the go products for the local Winnipeg community. Most recently, Abi has started a new business venture, one aimed to support local businesses that are most impacted during COVID. Good Local is an online marketplace that is structured similar to Amazon, but everything is local. So now with hundreds of vendors and thousands of products online, Abi has created a local ecosystem where everyone can flourish and uh, gather together during COVID. Time and time again, Abi has proven his love and dedication to Winnipeg. With his previous role on the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce's Small Business Advisory Council, he also sits on uh, Winnipeg Harvest uh, Council, Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, and, and many others. So please welcome a familiar face, uh, one that needs really no introduction. Uh, please welcome Abi Khan. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me here today with you. 
it was either speaking here or staying in bed all day, crying, complaining, pondering what we're going to do during this pandemic. However, since we're all entrepreneurs, we don't cry, we don't have emotions, we don't give up and we don't complain. I had no other choice but to be here today. Plus, if I wasn't here, Lauren Remillard uh, would have been really angry with me and threatened to revoke my membership. So I had to be here. As a former football player, many of you know me as I suffered a ton of injuries. Um, ruptured tricep, four knee surgeries, ACL, MCL, meniscus. I had a herniated disc in my back, ruptured triceps. Five broken fingers, which on Zoom you can kind of see are still kind of broken. They're not as bad as Walby's, but they're still kind of broken. Uh, I had major surgery. I suffered from Crohn's and colitis. I actually had my whole entire large intestine removed. And uh, the prognosis was I'll never play football again. I should just give up. I'll never make that recovery. I made that recovery the following year, and I played another four years. Right from playing football, I went into restaurant entrepreneurship. And when I mean right after, it was one and a half months after winning a silver medal in the Grey Cup. Not many people can say they've won a silver medal. I won three silver medals in the Grey Cup. It's a pretty great achievement. Forget winning the Grey Cup. I have three silvers. Um, I went right into the restaurant industry. Uh, eight years later, you can fast forward. I now have three shawarma cons, three green carrot juice companies, and three at the football stadium. So that's nine. Uh, and we're continuing to rock and roll and grow and grow and grow, uh, which I want to say thank you to Shorma Khan and Green Carrots for being the title main sponsor of today's evening. Uh, without Shorma Khan and Green Carrots, none of the chamber would even exist. So thank you, Shorma Khan and Green Carrots. I'm just joking. Uh, we're not actually sponsors, but because I'm keynoting, I can say that. Uh, I do want to take two seconds and thank our sponsors for this, e uh, this evening, this day. Um, without them, this would really not be possible. And it's funny because as I'm reading the list, I actually do all my business needs, all my banking with them. Um, just worked out that way. They're the best in the city. So uh, RBC, thank you for all you do. KPMG, ask for Ryan Palmer. He will give you a discount. Uh, the Chamber Plan and BDC, thank you for BDC for always being there for me whenever I need money, uh, especially now during COVID. So KPMG, RBC, Chamber Plan and BDC. Reach out to the Chamber if you need any help with any of those people and they'll put you in touch with the right people. Okay, back on topic here. So I played in the CFL for 10 years, countless injuries, opened a business. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done and the hardest industry in the restaurant industry. Never had a real job before and here I am playing in the Great Cup, opening my restaurant. Eight years later, we have eight more restaurants. However, all that is nothing compared to what we're all dealing with today. Yes, I've had my hard moments before. Of course I did. You asked me then five years ago, what was the hardest? I would have said that time. You asked me 10 years ago when I blew out my knee, I would have said that's the hardest thing I've had to deal with. But that's the funny thing about time. We forget about the pain and the hardship in the moment and we just remember what we've learned, the journey, the lessons, the failures, the successes along the way. So if you ask me now, I would say, yeah, this is the hardest thing I'm doing right now. 10 years ago, it was that, now it's this. Um, this is the hardest thing I've had to deal with that I can recall with, with the pandemic and the stores and everything going on. But we keep going as entrepreneurs of small businesses. We keep pushing forward. It's what we do. We're wired that way. I've always said I've had two choices in my life, really when it boils down to it. And you can divide people into really two camps. One is they say, whoa, me, this is way too hard. I can't do this. I'll never be able to achieve this. This is crazy. I give up. It's not worth it. How many people do we know like that? Really, that say, this is just too hard. I can't do this. And they stop or they change their path because it's too hard. The second camp are people like us who say, bring it on. It's just the way we're wired as small businesses and entrepreneurs. We say, bring it on. I want more. I want more. I want more. Uh, whatever you throw at me, we'll fight through that because that's what we do as small business owners. Now, during these difficult times, we find a way to get it done. I'm going to quote one of my great heroes here today. Uh, I hope some of you know, and I'm sure many of you do. Uh, this is a very, very important quote. I have lots of quotes on my walls. You can see this one there. There's one there. There's one right behind me. Uh, but this one here is, when you're backed up against the wall, break the goddamn thing down. The great Harvey Specter. Love that, man. Um, I can't see if you're all laughing, but I hope you are. When you're backed against the wall, break the goddamn thing down. That's what we're forced to do today. We're forced to break the wall down. 
to pivot, to redefine and reimagine ourselves in this world we live in today. This is what we do as small business owners. This is what the chamber has done with their reimagine campaign. Now, I'm from a shawarma con, from shawarma con, kingpin shawarma slinger, to a juice and smoothie maker. Now to something new, something reimagined, something redefined about myself. It's about inspiring businesses to embrace change, diversify and digitalize their business to be more resilient for the future. It's what we're forced to do. We're forced to break the wall down and find new ways to reimagine ourselves. Now you can check out this campaign the Chamber lost, uh, launched. I'm honored to be part of it. Shormacon on one side, uh, my new venture, Good Local on the other side. And that's how we reimagine. I'm sure you're all going through this right now and you're all thinking about this. Um, so check out the campaign, uh, winnipegchamber.com slash reimagine and, and you get more, a little bit more insight into what's happening. And you know, I was honored to be part of this, but there's also a lot of other businesses in here as well. This is what we're forced to do. We have no choice. We have to bring it on. We have to find a new way. Now, when the first pandemic first hit, I had to close my stores. It was devastating. Um, like I said, as entrepreneurs, we don't have emotion. We don't have much of an emotional capacity. We don't cry. But I remember I cried, cried that day uh, in the car when I was loading up, when I was sweeping the floors and emptying the fridges and getting the stock all out. But I knew I had to go on. I had to find another way. Too much people relied on my, me and my businesses. We employed almost 80 staff. Uh, I relied on it. It was my sole income. I put too much into the business to give up. And we don't give up. So I kept working. Came to work every single day, even when downtown was... Like, uh, you know, The Walking Dead, there was nobody around. But I was here, I'd park my car in the parking lot. I'd walk over by myself and I would get to the office. I found a way to reduce food costs, to reduce our labor a little bit where we could, to take that little extra money we had and push it a little bit farther and make that extra mile. And now we're back open. Four to the six stores are flourishing now. Even during this code red pandemic, we're still doing great. The pandemic has forced me to think outside the box, to break that wall down. If I was experiencing a shutdown, I felt like everyone else was too. Other business owners, big or small, uh, brick or mortar or online, everyone was hurting. But we ha immediately, I thought of, well, we have to get through this together. How can I help them? And that's just you know, the type of person I am, and a lot of you are, is we're always thinking about helping other people. So I wanted to support everyone. I said, well, I need to go spend my money somewhere. And I don't have a lot of money. As entrepreneurs, we all know we don't have a lot of money. If you're being an entrepreneur for the money, you should probably find another job because there's not a lot of money in entrepreneurship, at least not yet. I'm eight years in and I'm still kind of broke. So that's okay. I love what I do. It's the passion. But I wanted to support local and I didn't know how to do it. So what else can you do? Um, I said, there's got to be a place where I can find local things, everything good, everything local, all in one place. Uh, buy it, support it, get them the money and then get everything to me. And there really wasn't. So my partner and I, Ali Ismail, who's my partner in this new venture, we started looking around and we couldn't find anything to support 100% local. So we said, screw it. If there's nowhere to support local all in, one, all in one place, this is what everyone wants to do, support local. Why don't we make a platform that can do it? And he said, yeah, let's do it. I said, great, let's do it. So that's how we started. We wanted to support local because this pandemic was hurting everyone. So we made a platform called goodlocal.ca. If you haven't checked it out yet, you must live under a rock. Uh, it's been all over the news nationally everywhere. Uh, so check it out, please. Go local.ca. It's everything good and everything local all in one spot. Uh, we even have a really nice fancy logo. Take a look at that. It might remind you of something else, but we won't talk about those bad guys. Uh, so we created a multi-vendor platform where you can browse, shop, everything and anything local, put it all in one cart and have it delivered to your house. I didn't break the goddamn wall down. I blew up the goddamn wall. And that's the mindset we have to have. We're not just going to go through it slowly. We're not just going to take a slight pivot. We are going to break that goddamn thing down. We're going to blow it up. And that's what we did. Now, at the time, I didn't realize what we were doing. But what we have done now is change the landscape of how people are really shopping already at this local level. People say to me, why am I supporting local? I go, are you serious? What else is more important than supporting local right now? More than 1 million small businesses account for more than 10 million jobs in Canada. 10 million jobs in Canada from small businesses. It's estimated that for every $100 you spend a local business, almost $68 to $75 stayed local. That's $75 local. You, you buy $100 on some big box store, it's gone. 
it creates jobs. 85.3% of net job creation in the, small, in the private sector was due to small businesses. 89% in 2017. Local businesses contribute more to local charities and fundraiser than any national partner. Local businesses care. Increased customer choice because local businesses have a smaller consumer base. They have the advantage of tailoring their products and sales strategy for their communities to help increase the diversity of local products and services. You get better customer service. Um, small businesses uh, increase the value of communities. The value of homes go up in that area. I mean, the, the, the trickle down effect of small businesses goes on and on and on. If we don't support local now, it won't be here when this is all done. It won't. The big box stores will survive. We see all every day on the news, the stocks going up at Walmart and Costco and Amazon. They're gonna be fine. Small businesses won't be. We have to support small businesses. Large businesses, unfair wages, unfair practices, child labor, unsafe working conditions, cheap, wasteful, garbage products, and yet people are still going there. We need to support local, and this is what I've tried to do with Good Local. It has to stop and it will stop now. There are a few good things to come out of this pandemic. I think there are actually a lot of good things. We've connected more, more with family. I had a Zoom call with my university buddies I haven't spoke to in 20 years. We learned to slow down a bit. Well, not me, but most people learn to slow down. We learned to care for each other more, have a greater capacity for empathy. We've learned to care for local businesses. That is so important. 83% of participants in an online poll in June agreed that they want to support local more. 83%, that's huge. They're determined to shop local more than they were in the past. The Royal Bank of Canada, one of our sponsors, is spending big bucks on multimedia advertising campaign to encourage customers to shop locally. To shop locally. 82% of people are worried that their businesses won't be here when this pandemic is done. The numbers are staggering. People care. People want to support local. This is a case for supporting local. We got to do it. Now is the time to do it. There's so many benefits of supporting local. I mean, I can go on and on and on, but my time is running out here. People do care. I created a platform where you can stay home, stay safe, and support local all at the same time. It's kind of an oxymoron. How do you stay home and support local? Well, we made it. And the last three weeks have shown, have proven that people care. We have over 700 orders in one week. We've done over $150,000 in gross sales in two weeks. That's 150 grand to local businesses. That tells me you care. The case for supporting local is there. It's everywhere. The least you can do is go to my website, goodlocal.ca, purchase something, uh, and that money goes right to local businesses. So thank you very much for your time. Remember, stay home, stay safe, and support local. And if you don't know how to support local, go to goodlocal.ca. Thank you very much, guys. Have a great day, great morning. Uh, be safe out there, and I look forward to seeing you at the next Chamber event. Thank you, Abby. On behalf of my team at SmackDab and the entire small business community, I just want to thank you for building Good Local and dedicating yourself so passionately to our community. I see you on social media making those Good Local deliveries with your son, and it really does mean a lot. Everyone, please go check out goodlocal.ca for your shopping needs and everything local you could possibly imagine. So we're all done here pretty much. So how was that? Lots of great marketing tips, right? So before we jump into our breakout sessions, I want to just remind you to go check out our new campaign, uh, which is called Reimagine Winnipeg, and you can find it at uh, the Winnipeg Chamber website. So winnipeg-chamber.com slash reimagine Winnipeg, where we're encouraging all businesses to embrace change. And as a start, you can join us next Friday, December 11th, at our first ever Reimagine Your Chamber membership forum, where you can influence our programming and advocacy efforts during this pandemic. Regist registration is free and online at the Winnipeg Chamber website. So now let's move into more networking and community discussion. Or if you want to shop some more, you can also do that at this point. So this roundtable session is your opportunity to maximize this experience and debrief what you learned today and how you apply these lessons moving forward in your business. So here's how, it, here's how it's going to work. So on the left hand side, you will see a tab that says sessions under the stage tab. Join whatever session you'd like and whosoever birthday is coming up first in your group can serve as the facilitator of the group. It's just the easier way uh, to go about it. So if you, if you are the facilitator, please encourage everyone to just do a quick introduction of themselves. 
So once uh, the introductions are done, you have three questions you can discuss. You can discuss what new marketing tips stuck out to you today of the four keynote sessions, um, what marketing tactics have been successful for your team and in your business, and what are your favorite local brands to shop this holiday season. So please go ahead, click on the sessions tab and join a breakout room. So that's it for me, you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope everyone has a happy holiday. And please, as always, please stay safe, stay home, wear a mask and watch your social distance. And always remember to support local. Bye.